Squid Game, the pop culture phenomenon which has spread its tentacles all around the world and throughout multiple mediums. The number one show on Netflix right now is obviously doing something right, but what is it about this show that makes it stand out amongst the countless streaming originals that have come before it? I'm Matt Rogers and join me today as we take a look at the genius that is Squid Game. But before we get to that, if you want videos on the latest movies and TV shows delivered straight to your subscription feed, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to not miss a single thing. Now it takes a lot for a non-English speaking show or movie to make it big in English speaking countries. Unfortunately, a lot of people just don't like reading subtitles, but thankfully there's been some great examples of Korean entertainment breaking through those barriers. A perfect example would be 2019's Parasite, which did a clean sweep at the Oscars that year. But now we have Korea taking over our small screens also. Now from here there's a massive spoiler warning for the entire first season, so if you haven't yet finished the show, stop this video right now and come back when you have. Now the concept of Squid Game is simple. People have been given an opportunity to compete in childhood games for a chance to win a huge cash prize. But what I came to love so much about this show and what I'll be talking about in this video is how Squid Game subverts your expectations, leaving you never quite knowing what to expect. Predictability is so commonplace these days, it's nice to finally get a show that has you constantly guessing what's going to happen next, and rarely giving you the satisfaction of being right. Now it all starts with the obvious. By contrasting bright, colourful, childlike rooms and games, the giant doll in the first game is a bit of a segue as it looks innocent, but its sheer size and emotionless face lets you know that something's up. But before you get too comfortable, you're hit hard with intense violence and utter disregard for human life, juxtaposition at its finest. There's definitely something unnerving about pools of blood and bodies scattered amongst an otherwise innocent setting. But the concept of expecting the unexpected doesn't stop there. Straight after the first game, the contestants decide to vote whether they want to continue. After everyone casts their vote, you immediately think the final contestant, number one, votes to continue the games, because how else would the show go on? It surely won't end after just one game. But lo and behold, he votes not to continue and the games come to a grinding halt. And now knowing number one's true identity, sending them home was a genius way to give the contestants more motive, to continue the games and actually want to play. I think number one knew from experience that upon returning, the contestants will give it their all for the remaining games, if they were to return by choice. And they do. After the players return and the games resume, the Harvesting Organ side story appears to hint at the Doctor playing a larger role as the games play out, but before long it culminates in his death just a few episodes in, and does actually play a crucial part in not just the search for the policeman Jun Ho's brother, but also the dynamics of the fourth game, making the number of remaining contestants odd, whilst also expressing the importance of equality amongst the contestants. Once we reached the game of marbles, as there was an odd number of contestants, we just accepted the fact that number 212 is left partnerless and most likely eliminated. But expectations are subverted yet again and we see her unharmed and ready for the next game. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Back to the heart-wrenching game of marbles, a brutal mechanic was introduced and almost all contestants chose to pair up with their closest friend in the competition only to have them realise they are required to go head to head with only one survivor. Not one line of dialogue is wasted in this episode, with some fantastic character building and contestants really showing their true colours. And don't even get me started on the wasted tears on number one. I have a rule that I always try to remember and that is if you don't see someone die on screen, they're probably not dead. But having to select shapes, teams and partners forced the contestants to make major decisions without any prior knowledge to support these decisions, leaving them with only instinct and no logic. My favourite example in my personal favourite game was the VIP episode with the glass panels. This game was expertly introduced by having the order of play chosen by the players, a dilemma that caused someone trying to prove himself by going first actually having the worst chance once the game began. With that logic, once the game is revealed, last position sounds preferable, but as the game timer dwindles, you soon realise those later in the pack are not in much better of a position. But let's talk about one of the main plot twists, the true identity of number one. This old man has a few tricks of avoiding death. The popular one that people are pointing out right now is he actually doesn't get scanned by the doll in Red Light Green Light, probably why he smiles so hard throughout the game. 
but upon re-watching I also noticed that when the riot breaks out overnight, he hides up high and yells out for everyone to stop and the game organisers interfere almost immediately, because he's obviously at risk and unable to defend himself if it came down to it. Plus he is presumably missing from the VIP episode, as the front man asks the VIPs to excuse the host as he is dealing with a personal matter. But now that number one is no more, what effect will this have on the games? The season finale allows for the continuation of the series, but there are mixed reports whether we will get a second season. I think Netflix would be making a huge mistake to end the phenomenon here, but I guess it's really up to the creators. But with many potential plots and theories that could be explored in the second season, what do you think could happen? Will number 456 return to expose the whole operation? Maybe we'll be treated to a prequel to see how this all began. I'd love to hear what you think so let me know, I'll be down there in the comments. But be sure to subscribe for weekly videos covering your favourite movies and TV shows. If you subscribed during this video then welcome aboard and if you had a good time hanging out then spank that like button. This is Matt Rogers and that is all.